Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part 4, Intergalactic Planetary. If you're new to the series, click on the I in the top corner to watch from the beginning. In the middle of Creation Day 4 discussion, the movie takes an unexpected break from cosmology to talk about the nature of science itself. You see, the other thing they've done in our education system, they said science can only explain things by natural processes. It's not that some education board somewhere has clipped the wings of science that might otherwise make supernatural conclusions. The truth is that science itself is limited to studying the natural. I don't think Ken nor anyone in the film would suggest that science is equipped to study the supernatural. God cannot be put in a test tube. If there is something outside of nature, the scientific method cannot tell us anything about it. Scientists throughout history have acknowledged that they attempt to learn how things work, not who made them work. It may be true that God designed caterpillars to turn into butterflies, but a paper saying that God made it that way doesn't help as much as a paper describing the mechanics of the process. And describing the process naturally says nothing to deny possible supernatural origins. This is called methodological naturalism, a philosophy adopted by scientists of all faiths, or no faith, all agreeing to frame their work in terms of the natural, precisely because the supernatural simply cannot be studied by the scientific method. It would be as unhelpful as considering the color of the sunset in evaluating mathematical equations. Dr. Mary Schweitzer, among the world's most famous active Christian scientists, who is referenced later in this movie, put it this way. Absolutely. When I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. They've even changed the definition of science from the uh, study of the natural world using the five senses to be the search for natural explanation. The philosophy of methodological naturalism goes back to Thales of Miletus back in 600 BC, long before Jesus walked the earth. The word science itself didn't appear until 2,000 years later, in the 1400s when it meant collective knowledge in keeping with the meaning of its Latin root word, scientia. Like any word, usage has changed over time, but it has consistently been associated with the activity of seeking, systemizing, and sharing knowledge. The word scientist was coined in 1833 by William Wheel. For context, that's several years after Charles Darwin set sail on the HMS Beagle. Prior to that, everyone who we now call scientists would have gone by the title of naturalist, students of a branch of philosophy called natural philosophy. Notable Christians Galileo, Kepler, Bacon, Copernicus, Descartes, Pascal, and Newton, to name just a few, all went by the title of naturalist. These men are praised in Ken's Creation Museum, but they all adhered to methodological naturalism for their work. If you do a search for Danny's definition, the study of the natural world using the five senses, the only place you can find it is in a handful of books and articles written by Danny. But who decided that? That's an arbitrary definition. That specifically excludes any possibility of God being involved. God has not only been kicked out, but he's most unwelcome. What I have been describing is methodological naturalism, an agreement to temporarily focus on the natural in the context of specific conversations, because only the natural can be studied with the scientific method. Ken seems to be talking about philosophical naturalism, which would be an individual's assertion that nothing beyond the natural exists. Philosophical naturalism is not a requirement for science. There are effective scientists of all faiths. Nothing in science excludes every possibility of a god, because it simply can't. Science says nothing about the supernatural. In astronomy, as any other science, I think there are evidences that the world is far younger than uh, many people think. Uh, spiral galaxies would be a good example. They actually spin more rapidly at the center and more slowly out at the edges. Obviously, if this thing spins around several times, it starts smearing out the spiral arms. And uh, as that happens, you would spin it out to the point you'd end up with this amorphous disk. They think these galaxies are at least 10 billion years old. So these things would be entirely smeared out. But in 6,000 years, not much smearing taking place. In billions of years, it's a problem. Problem, thousands of years, not a problem. The spiral is one of the most common galaxy shapes we've observed, 
often with two arms, but we've observed galaxies with three and more. And if the arms of these galaxies were made up of a fixed set of stars, then by Kepler's third law they would indeed be stretched out and wound up like some kind of cosmic taffy machine. But it turns out, the arms aren't composed of a fixed set of objects, but really a pattern produced by density waves. Stars and cosmic materials are constantly coming and going from the arms, but the gravity of the effect causes these objects to slow down long enough to cause the groupings we observe. Think of it like a traffic jam. It's not always the same set of cars making up the jam. The lead cars are constantly leaving and new cars are being added at the end. But from far away, the jam appears to be a fixed mass even though the cars that make up the jam is constantly changing. Density waves were first proposed by C. C. Lin and Frank Shu in the 1960s, after it was observed that the arm structures themselves were moving much slower than the speed of the individual stars that made up the arms. If the stars are moving at different speeds than the arms, they simply cannot be permanent elements of the arms. Stars tend to move around the center of their galaxies in elliptical orbits, but if that center is shifting, you start to get this pattern in subsequent orbits. Keep adding the tilted orbits, and inevitably you get something that looks like two spiral arms, rotating density waves. The model is successful in explaining why two-armed configurations would be most frequent, but how other numbers are possible, and predicted that this type of compression would trigger star formation. And it does. Young stars are most frequent on the leading edge of the spiral arms. Comets really do have something to say about the uh, age of the solar system. We can divide comets into two groups, we call the short period comets and the long period comets. For short period comets, a couple hundred thousand years, they're all gone, there shouldn't be any left. Long period comets, well, tens of millions, maybe a hundred million years, but they're all gone again. So for billions of years, solar system, you have a problem. Thousands of years, not a problem. It should be clear that the age of a comet says nothing more about the age of the universe than the fresh milk in my fridge says about the age of my fridge. Danny needed to add one more sentence for this claim to be coherent. The fact that astronomers generally accept that most comets are formed during the formation of a solar system as balls of leftover ice and dust. Danny is only partially right about the ages of comets. The ranges he gives are for comets that end up entering the solar system and coming closer to the sun. You can measure how long it takes an ice cube to melt under a heat lamp, but that tells you nothing about how long that ice cube is in the freezer before being put under the lamp. But where is this deep freeze keeping comets fresh? Well, in 1950 and 1951, two separate clusters of comets were proposed, by Jan Ort and Gerard Kuiper respectively. No longer merely proposed, but highly observed since 1992, the Kuiper Belt is a region beyond Neptune about 4.5 to 7.5 billion kilometers from the Sun, containing trillions of frigid objects ranging from tiny balls to bodies over 100 kilometers in diameter. The most famous object in the Kuiper Belt is former planet Pluto, though over a thousand have been documented in the past decade, like Eris, Ceres, Haumea, and Makemake. You may recall news stories a few years ago about Planet 9. That's also an inferred Kuiper Belt object. But most of the objects are what Danny refers to as short period comets. When one of these ice bodies comes too close to a larger body like Neptune, its trajectory is changed, redirected toward the sun, or hurled away into deeper space. This is the cause of the sun nearing comets that we are familiar with. Long period comets come from a similar region even further out, known as the Oort cloud starting roughly 300 billion kilometers out, 70 times further than Neptune, and extending much further out than that perhaps as far as a light year. Because the Oort cloud is a sphere rather than a disk, comets from this region can come from nearly any angle. The New Horizon spacecraft that documented Pluto back in 2015 will pass close by Kuiper Belt Object 2014 MU69 on January 1st of 2019, and NASA expects knowledge of the region to increase greatly as the mission progresses. I suspect Danny will want to abandon or modify the claims he made here in the coming months. We understand the sun is powered by nuclear fusion, and that could power the sun for billions of years. As it produces energy like that, it changes its composition inside, and over time, it should slowly brighten. And as it does, uh, the Earth would get warmer. Now, again, over thousands of years, not a problem. But if you go back a couple of billion years, three billion years or so, when life first supposedly developed on the planet, uh, you have a problem because the Earth would have been far colder, and it would have been frozen, and nobody thinks that that happened. And billions of years, it's a problem. Thousands of years, not a problem. This has been dubbed the early faint sun paradox and Danny wrote an article about it in 2001. But the observations he based it on were first made by Carl Sagan and George Mullen back in 1972. 
Like all good paradoxes, there are two contradicting ideas that appear to be true at once. Making the kind of present is the key to the past assumption criticized by the film earlier, Danny is doing a linear extrapolation of a single variable, temperature, and declaring this conjecture to be in conflict with the established start of life around 3.8 billion years ago. We don't actually know the conditions of initial life on Earth, and there's independent reason to think that life began in the warmth of undersea geothermal vents unaffected by the surface temperature. So Danny's paradox is actually conjecture on both ends. The more quantifiable potential paradox he could have mentioned is between ancient sun temperature and the earliest existence of liquid form water. High precision analysis of ancient zircon indicates that the rock interacted with water 4.3 billion years ago. If the sun was indeed far colder then, this would certainly be a paradox. But in 2003, advancements in helioseismology, using sound waves to measure the interior of the sun in a similar way that they are used to measure earth plate tectonics, allowed precise measurements indicating that our sun lost at least 4-7% to of its mass during its youth. In 2011, astronomers published this paper with observations showing that stars analogous to our sun consistently exhibit early life mass loss due to large variability in X-ray and ultraviolet emissions. While further study remains, the suggested 20-25% to loss of early solar mass resolves all the faint sun paradox problems. This new model explains other observations as well, including early water on Mars. Meanwhile, the 40-year-old solar model Faulkner builds his argument upon has not held up to new observations in lithium abundance or helioseismology. In fact, other planets in our solar system testify to a young universe as well. Both the density and magnetic field of Mercury cannot allow for millions of years. This is the first of a number of very brief scientific claims thrown out by the movie in rapid succession. But as we have more time here, it's worth looking at each one by one, even though some were difficult to research based on the few words said. This mercury density and magnetic field claim likely originates from this article by Russell Humphreys. Humphreys claimed the magnetic field on mercury cannot be explained on a planet without a liquid core, and in his estimation, a planet as small as mercury must have a solid core. But in 2007, physicists used ground-based radio telescopes to measure Mercury's spin rate. The highly characteristic variations point to the planet having a molten core after all. As such, new evidence has falsified Humphrey's old assumption. Speaking of Humphrey's predictions... In 1984, Russell Humphreys correctly calculated the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune several years before the Voyager 2 satellite would measure them. Humphreys used a vital clue from the Bible that the universe was made only 6,000 years ago. The movie is referencing this 1984 paper, where Humphreys made predictions about the magnetic fields of Mercury, Mars, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto at a time before those magnetic fields had been directly measured by spacecraft. It is correct to say that Humphreys included a time since creation value of 6,000 years in his calculation, but an analysis of his work by NASA scientist Tim Thompson shows that Humphreys' characteristic decay time formula is calculated by dividing this arbitrarily selected time, t, by the magnetic dipole strength at a time of creation, mc, which is itself a function of the same arbitrarily selected t. This means that literally any amount of time chosen would yield values of the same scale giving time effectively no influence on the results in this model. In fact, the single most impactful variable in Humphrey's model is the arbitrarily selected dipole strength, the torque caused by magnetic force on a pair of oppositely charged poles. At the time of writing, measured magnetic dipole moment values for Earth and Saturn were known by Humphreys, so he simply chose values for Neptune and Uranus larger than the Earth, but smaller than Saturn in proportion to their known sizes. He made a guess based entirely on relative mass, and those guesses turned out to be vaguely in the ballpark, though merely within an order of magnitude. In Thompson's evaluation, Humphrey's theory cannot be confirmed since it predicts at once every possible observed field, and is therefore useless in predicting anything. And when the surface of Venus was mapped in the mid-90s, volcanoes, craters, mountains, and other features showed the history of the planet was young. The film is referencing a decade-old soundbite like this 2006 New Scientist article. Even though the headline says, Venus's surface may be older than thought, it includes this quote that Magellan found fewer Venus surface craters than expected, suggesting that the planet's surface is actually very young. Of course, it's quite common for predictions in science to be off. While they overestimated the number of craters on Venus, they underestimated how much of the surface area would be covered, 89%. 
and in a random distribution of location, depth, and composition consistent with billions of years of existence. Further studies in volcanic lava flow on Venus indicate that the valley must be at least 2 billion years old. So why did these scientists say that the surface is young? Let's read the whole quote. Suggesting that the planet's surface is actually very young, perhaps 500 million to 1 billion years old. To cosmologists, a billion years is young. But Eric chose to allow his audience to think that they meant a few thousand years. Neptune's too hot to be old. Cindy Crawford is too hot to be old. You may have heard me say that before, because about a year ago, a brief clip of the film was previewed. At the time, this claim was given to a moon of Neptune, not Neptune itself. Neptune's moon, Miranda, is too hot to be old. With a surface temperature of minus 187 degrees Celsius, the claim that Miranda was hot was strange. Changing the claim to Neptune isn't intuitive either, with even colder temperatures of minus 200 degrees Celsius. However, I found this creation article discussing Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune as all four planets radiate more heat than they receive from the Sun. In the case of Neptune, 2.6 times the energy from the Sun. The creation paper speculates that God simply made Neptune very hot initially, and it simply hasn't cooled all the way down yet. But this model doesn't hold up well to Neptune temperature observations which have held steady for decades, and have actually increased in the past 15 years, not cooled down. The graphic on screen of the movie says that only a young planet can generate heat. But there are chemical processes, atmospheric conditions, radiation, fusion, thermal properties of the core, and more that can fully account for net heat from a planetary body. That science does not yet have enough data to be conclusive as to which of these are at play in Neptune's particular case shouldn't be mistaken for impossibility. Future exploration will undoubtedly reveal more, helping to confirm one of these ideas, or perhaps proposing entirely new ones. Pluto still has nitrogen in its atmosphere. Earth and other planets have nitrogen, so I wasn't sure what was problematic about Pluto nitrogen until I found Danny's article where he asserts that because Pluto is small, it possibly should have been depleted long ago. But that doesn't sound very precise. It turns out the rate of nitrogen escape from Pluto has been studied. Assuming the current rate of 500 tons per hour, multiplied by 4.5 billion years, that's a mere 0.15% of Pluto's total mass. A fraction of a percent in all that time doesn't seem problematic. The rings of Saturn and Neptune aren't uniform as they would be after millions of years. While I couldn't find any predictive modeling to show us what billion-year planetary rings should look like, it has long been established that planetary rings don't form at the same time as the planet itself. Rather, they are made out of debris drawn in later by the body's gravity. This could be literally any amount of time after planetary formation. The rings and the planets are not the same age. That said, in 2007, NASA released findings indicate that the debris in Saturn's rings are a wide variety of ages. The rings accumulated not in a single event, but we now observe that the material is constantly recycling, shattering and reforming in the frictionless vacuum of space, defying any atmosphere-centric sorting expectations. So do we trust in the timeline of men who are repeatedly wrong and having to change their beliefs? Why would it be a bad thing to adjust what you believe when flaws are detected, new evidence is found, or new insights are gleaned? Or do we trust in the Bible, which has never been proven wrong? Never been proven wrong is a poor standard. That leprechauns exist has never been proven wrong. That holding a banana in your ear prevents alien abduction has never been proven wrong. That souls are reincarnated has never been proven wrong. I would think that for important matters, the standard should be proven right. And does not change. One need look no further than Mark 16 or John 8 to know that the contents of the Bible have changed over time. And, of course, the interpretation of the Bible can change drastically from era to era, and even person to person. Would you want to go to a doctor who is deliberately unaware of new treatments? Would you want to go to a mechanic who refuses to check your vehicle's computer? Something that never changes is rarely a good thing. Next on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost Part 5 Life from Non-Life Tap the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss it. If you'd like to support the work of Apologia, please consider becoming a patron at the link in the description. Thanks for watching.